Ladies and gentlemen, this is Adam Kokich here at the California State Libertarian Party Convention with the infamous Star Child at Large representative on the Libertarian National Committee, friend of mine for a long time, San Francisco resident. Are you originally from San Francisco? Uh, more or less, East Bay, but my grandmother lived in the city, so I was in the city all the time growing up, and I call myself a native. Yeah, see, I was born in San Francisco, grew up in the Bay Area, so we got, we got some of that in common. Wait, you were born in the city? I was born in oh, San Francisco Children's Hospital. Well, you knew I grew up in the Bay Area, right? San, San Mateo I area. I remember that. I know you've been there before, but I didn't remember you were from there originally. Well, last time we hung out was on our tour two years ago in San Francisco oh, at the Firehouse. Remember, remember the Firehouse? In, anyway. Oh, but that wasn't last time. Actually, I saw you in Berkeley after that. That's true. He gets, he gets around. Um, but as you're, you're an at-large member of the LNC, right. please give us, for, for the audience, a sense of your background with the party and, and how you came to be on the, on the board. Yeah, so I've been an activist uh, basically since the early 90s, and um, I was a Republican activist even before that. Uh, I was interested in politics from a young age after getting in, involved in you know, learning about history and really being fascinated by history and battles and stuff as a kid. And then as I got a little older, I started to think, like, what's really behind this stuff? You know, what, what does it matter ultimately? Uh, and, uh, you know, who are the good guys and who are the bad guys here? Um, so even as a, a Republican, I was pretty pro-freedom, but uh, the whole non-aggression thing didn't, um, didn't click for me right away. It took some, some exposure to the party, and uh, reading Ayn Rand uh, played a role. Uh, joining the military played a role. I was also like you uh, in the U.S. government's military, <laughs> which I, I don't recommend to anyone, but it was, it was an interesting cultural experience. It actually made me more liberal. We, we have a lot more than our share of veterans yeah, in the LP. Too, I think. But, um, yeah, so uh, basically I've been a uh, strong party activist since the 90s, uh, but really my first allegiance, as I say, is to the movement, not the party. People, people should always mistrust institutions because institutions can and do go astray. And ultimately I say that the party is just a vehicle. You know, it's a good vehicle right now. I, I think it's, you know, the, probably the largest single libertarian institution in the world. And numbers matter. I want to see us have a mass movement. Because when push comes to shove, you know, violent uh, street, uh, you know, revolution kind of thing is w one way to topple governments. We ideally prefer not to see that happen. You know, the, either, the other two alternatives are either a palace coup, uh, well, three alternatives really, all out war, <laughs> Uh, or in the palace coup, you know, tends to just be more of the same. The all-out war is horrible and bloody. We don't want that. And the third alternative is people, massive numbers of people getting out in the streets and refusing to leave until the governments topple. You know, and you see that in like the Czechoslovakia, the Velvet Revolution in Ukraine, the Orange Revolution, the Philippines, getting rid of Marcos. You know, there's, there's a lot of uh, examples where massive numbers of people coming together have uh, toppled governments peacefully. Do you think it's going to come to that kind of point if the the, uh, the LP becomes a mechanism by which we get to critical mass of challenging the system? I think it could. I, it's not guaranteed, but uh, political parties, uh, workers' organizations, and students, those are usually the three groups that historically are at the forefront of uh, peaceful resolutions in terms of toppling these kind of oppressive systems. And the nonviolent, as we've demonstrated many times with Adam versus the man, is always more likely to succeed than a violent revolution. It's more inclusive, you have more popular commitment, and you end up with a more sustainable res yeah, resolution. But, but so like in the, in the U.S., if it was the LP, it would be like, well, what, we, we get a candidate who's polling at 25% for president and they, they still don't let him in the debates? Something like that could lead to that. But do, do you think we're not going to be able to do this through the ballot box here in the U.S.? Well, we can't, we can't go into it saying our campaign and winning and everything depends on us getting into the debates, which is unfortunately what, what Johnson and Well did. And it's kind of like, you know, telling the establishment, Here, here's how you defeat us. You know, we're, we're saying right now that our campaign will fail if we don't get in the debates. So all you have to do is keep us out of the debates and we will lose. And, and it, was, it was a very bad strategy. Um, I mean, there's no guarantee, uh, you know, get in the official debates anyway, but the official debates become less and less relevant the more independent media power we have. So it's really about moving uh, hearts and minds and building a mass movement. And uh, I even declared as an LNC member, you know, we have to declare our conflicts of interest on the committee. And I declared that I have a conflict of interest between my loyalty to the party and my loyalty to the movement. My first loyalty will always be to the movement because, as I said, institutions can and do go astray. And so... Uh, if um, the longer an institution t is around, the more uh, conservative, and not just ideologically conservative, I mean more methodologically, 
uh, in terms of being uh, controlled by a group of insiders, just kind of hidebound, stuck in its ways. These things all tend to uh, uh, intensify as trends the longer uh, an institution is around and the bigger it gets. So we haven't figured out how to deal with that basic problem of power in organizations. Uh, you know, when you get a group of people working together, how do you manage that problem of power? Because the people who are natural leaders will, will tend to, uh, you know, rise to the top of organizations unless there's some specific mechanism put in place to prevent that from happening. And some of those people are good leaders and are selfless and are not addicted to power, but a lot of them are addicted to power. They become addicted to power. And those people will, you know, they're ruthless because they're, they're power addicts, right? It is, I think, an addiction. I think most of the people at top levels of government in the United States and elsewhere are power addicts. And you think some of the people maybe who have come into the LP have come in for the wrong reasons over the last uh, couple decades? I'm sure some. I don't, I don't think it's most at this point. I think most of the people in the leadership that I work with are sincerely uh, strong libertarians. You know, they generally believe in the non-aggression principle and uh, want to see what's right for the party. But I think a lot of their, their policies and their methodology is uh, promoting the party in a way that it won't be sustainably libertarian because it will let too many of the wrong people in. It'll appeal to people on something other than the ideas. Uh, you know, when there's too much focus on winning, uh, that, that is deadly because people fail to distinguish between winning in conventional terms and winning in libertarian terms. Winning in conventional terms, getting elected, right? And some people in the LP talk to them and they, they kind of act like, well, all we have to do is get people in office who have an L next to their names and the rest will just take care of itself. But it won't. <laughs> That's just the beginning of the struggle because once you get in office, then the, the temptations and the, uh, uh, the, the you know, pressure to join the establishment and go with the flow and everything even intensify. So we have to make it clear that for us, winning is advancing the cause of freedom, period. Sometimes that can involve getting elected. Sometimes it means not getting elected. If you sacrifice principle to win, you've already lost. Exactly. So I'm really glad we got to cover all this because now you know why I'm so glad that Starchild is on the LNC and that he has that faith in the institution. But especially I don't since... Have faith <laughs> in the That's exactly the point. And, and don't get me wrong, I, I do, you know, obviously support the party and encourage people to join and, and, and donate and do what you can. But, but go into it with your eyes open. Don't just blindly donate. If, if you have a problem with the party... Uh, you, you see it doing the wrong things. You Show know, up and change it. That, use the carrot and use the stick, you know. Uh, our, our politicians need to be held accountable. And if anything, subservient to the party members, not sort of over them. One of the worst proposals I've heard recently is somebody who's floating the idea of making uh, elected libertarian office holders ex officio delegates at our convention. So they'd be like automatically have delegate status, kind of like the Democrats have their super delegates. This is just about the worst idea for the future of the party that somebody could come up with because, you know, right now most of the elected libertarians, I think, uh, are probably pretty solidly libertarian because there's not that many of them. And right now there's not a lot of uh, power, career, politician opportunities in running as a libertarian. But if the party ever really starts to take off and it does become a viable way to get into office, suddenly we're going to be inundated with people that are in it for the money and the power. You could have and a thousand then, state senators who are Democrats and Republicans say, I'm a libertarian now, and then they take over the party. Right. But hold on, I want, I'm really glad we got all this background because I wanted to put Starchild on the spot with something here. Oh, see, he's stalling because I know I got a tough question for him. No, no, I, I want to talk about that, but I just wanted to say the people that come in who are career politician types and in it for the money and the power, they won't, they won't say that. If they're smart, they will sound like pretty hardcore libertarians. And, and so unless we really have a strong party culture and structure to, to vet people and to make sure that only uh, principled people wind up in the decision-making pos positions within the party and that that's expected of people, they have to sign their name to stuff, you know. Um, if we don't protect ourselves that way, gradually we'll be overtaken by the careerists and go down that status path. And I assume what Starchild is referencing here are at least two things in the important mechanisms of this. One, the statement of principles that is embedded in the platform that can only be overturned by seven-eighths majority at the convention or altered in any way requires that majority. And the statement that you have to sign the pledge when you become a member of the LP that says, I oppose the initiation of force to achieve political and social goals. So Starchild and I... Not enough, though. Well, obviously, you need, you need the institution. You need the... <laughs> Well, because the, the pledge, I mean, I've heard people interpret it different ways. And if somebody doesn't really understand the non-aggression principle, 
they'll they'll see that language about not initiating force or fraud and they'll think well i'm not a, a bank robber you know i'm not a, a con artist uh, i can sign that but they won't think it that it means necessarily that you don't support coercive taxation or that you m support everybody being able to put whatever they want into their own bodies which is what it really does mean and uh so i i would like to see like a minimum score on the nolan chart for those who are familiar the diamond chart uh, that yeah. tells you what your uh you know do you favor you making a decision or government making a decision for each of these different I think the oath is enough. I think the pledge is enough. I think you just hold people to the pledge and you challenge them. And I think we should have, well, you know, we just developed this. And it's happening anyways that we have this culture, you know, where you put people on the spot. Do you really understand this? Do you really believe in the philosophy? We're glad that the LP is a gateway for a lot of people. But once you're here, we're going to challenge you. We're going to have these vibrant conversations. And a lot of it is dismissed as you know, bullshit infighting or, you know, purity tests. But no, I think, I think it really is important. We should be loving and welcome everybody in. I, I use the analogy of a church, like a good church. It'll be like everybody, you know, welcome, come join us on Sunday, be part of the congregation. We'll sing some great songs. You come to our church picnic, have a great time, but they're not going to invite people to get up on the pulpit or speak for the church or make decisions for the church's finances, this kind of thing, unless they're on the same page kind of theologically as how it should be in the same same should be true at the party. I think let everybody come to our events, you know, be a big tent. You know, by all means, we want to talk to everybody. We want to sit down and break bread with everybody. But we don't want you making decisions for the LP uh, unless you're hardcore libertarian. And this isn't just to, to protect ourselves. I mean, I would be delighted to belong to a libertarian party that was so uh, pure and hardcore that I did not personally qualify to be in the leadership. <laughs> because there are areas where I, I personally, like, I don't want anybody to own nuclear weapons, for example. I, I think that they're just too much of a standing threat to, to humanity and everybody's survival. But taking nuclear weapons away from somebody, that is unlibertarian. The Libertarian Party should never advocate uh, taking them away because a peaceful possession of any object is not a crime. You haven't initiated force or fraud. So what I would advocate in situations like that is, is civil disobedience. You know, people, people like myself who feel that the nuclear weapons are that much of a threat, we should be willing to go and uh, civilly, you know, dis try to disarm people with nukes and, and take, you know. Or in a free market, you, you economically ostracize anybody who's trying to build nuclear weapons, and they wouldn't be able to generally without a government, at least most people who would look at the free market. Anyway, he's, he's tricking me here. He's totally tricking me because I'm, I'm also passionately anti-nuke, and we could, we could see, he's, he's teasing me with all these sidebars and these rabbit holes to avoid this difficult question. So we're going to get to it now. We're going to get to it now. And, and I'm really glad, again, this is awesome because we covered all this stuff but uh arvin vorha and and personally i like him i think he's uh, i think of him as a friend he is the vice chair of the libertarian party and has been stirring controversy with what i think is a deliberately misguided strategy and in being inflammatory and one of the ways he's articulated this is saying let's be hardcore let's be inflammatory let's push away people who aren't ready to hear the message because the people who already will come are, are already will come our way i don't think the messaging needs to be that done that way to repel anybody, I think you can still attract people. You don't have to have that element to it, but he's you've shown how to do it, Adam, because you're you're hardcore like Ar Arvin is. I mean, I, I think in his campaign for Senate, I don't think he, he's even as radical as what you're saying running for president. But the difference is that you you do it with more of a loving message, where he's been doing it with with more of a, a message saying like these people are the enemy kind of thing. And I, it's I, it's angry. People when people see through that, and, and for libertarians to win. And for us to win on principle, we have to be the adults in the room. We have to be cool, calm, and collected and say, this is what needs to happen because this is righteous and this is just. Now, Arvin created a lot of controversy. He wants to go by every every sidebar. <laughs> I do want to go by every sidebar because there's, there's so many. I mean, it's like uh, Nicholas Wildstar who's running for governor here in California. Great candidate. I've been you know working to help him get out and get exposure. Uh, check out wildstar2018.com. Um, he was arrested uh, last year on MLK Day, racially profiled. He's a black man walking down the street on his way to work. And, you know, they, they, the cops, you know, said they were, fit the description of some suspect. They had a burglary in the neighborhood. Young black male. Maybe, maybe, maybe they did have some legitimate interest in talking to him, but they certainly didn't have any legitimate interest in arresting him. Um, and they, they probably, probably, though, if he had talked to them politely, it's possible that they would not have arrested him. But he reacted with, with anger. And, you know, he's like, why are you falling, you know, dropping F-bombs and so forth. And I think he was totally justified in doing that. I cannot morally fault him for having that righteous anger. And, and we do need some of that because the government is hurting people. And, and when you see that, you and think we want to represent that in the general public where there is that legitimate righteous anger. 
and and so I can't really fault people like Arvin and, and Nicholas for getting angry. It's it's a human emotion, but I do think it's more effective to to do the approach that, that you've uh, more recently sort of adopted in terms of of really trying to keep that loving message of of embracing people with compassion, saying it's it's the system that's the enemy, not not the individuals who work for the system. Uh, so so with Arvin, he, he started, the, the, the main thing that, that bothered a lot of people was talking about age of consent. And I think this is a very important issue for the LP. And w I defended Arvin for a long time, too, because I, I like generally messaging that's, that's exciting, that, 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 that has an impact, that gets people's attention. I think that's, that's more important. It's more important to get out there with bad messaging than to sit here arguing about messaging, because libertarians spend way too much time worrying about that. But we, when you're talking about age of consent, we should be talking about children have rights because human rights are universal. And he was, he was almost advocating from the uh, ability or, or right of an adult to have an, a, rela a relationship with someone who was younger. And, and to me, that was like... I think he was ever saying that the, the kid should be forced into such relationships without their consent. No, no, no of course not. And, and, and uh, I don't think anything he said crossed any technical lines. But I want, I think that what's really important for libertarianism is that we're, we're always advocating for the victim. We're always advocating for the underdog. We're always advocating for the disadvantage. That is so core to this message of, of universal nonviolence, as opposed to you know the, the right of, of of someone who's in a position of greater power in a relationship. I don't have a problem with them calling people in the military murderers because that's what you sign up to do. You sign up to kill for politicians in a premeditated way. Yeah. It's 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 not the best messaging, yeah, exactly. but I defended him at that point. Yeah. Um, but. But there were a couple things recently that crossed the line, like, and it was it, it was a jo an obvious joke, but a bad one. Where we said, you know, bad idea, school shootings, better idea, school board shootings. As in, and it was a joke. Obviously, he's not seriously saying, hey, let's go shoot up school boards. But it was it was it, it didn't it wasn't clear enough. Wasn't and clear. and some people did didn't realize he was joking. Actually, thought he was serious. And and I wasn't sure honestly when I when I saw that I said, you know, yeah, if he doesn't uh, disavow this, uh, then I I would support removing him well, from from the LNC because that's what I want to get I want to get past this the particulars with Arvin here and get get to the principles and, and, and your position on this because anytime stuff like this comes up in the LP there's there's always a, a big distracting debate like with with James Weeks dancing naked at the National Convention getting removed from the Michigan LP um, you know and he was he was actually taken out of a, a, a position just as a member of the state party because of that and i thought you know since censuring him would have been fine and i thought that's what should have happened with arvin that you know we don't need it we don't need him off the board there was a motion on the board to have him removed entirely from his position and the censuring allows me as a libertarian party member to say yeah what arvin is saying doesn't represent me it doesn't represent the party there was an official decision we censured that to say that doesn't represent us but when it so i was i was actually glad that the vote the, the board at the uh, the board vote actually went my way right he got censured but not removed and and you voted for neither censuring or removal why not at least when you're making uh, and, and it's it's not an obvious joke. It's a bad joke. It's it's a joke about violating the non-aggression principle. Why would you not vote to censure that? There is two oh, basic reasons. Now he's got to take the mic so we can't have any now more side mic. All right. <laughs> we don't we don't want any any uh, top-down control of the mic here, do we? Because otherwise your questions are gonna be like ten minutes long, and then I'll have a minute to answer. And how's that, how fair is that, right? <laughs> Right. You're, you're a skilled interviewer. <laughs> so my, my issues basically were two. One, one is that uh, the motion was worded in such a way that it, it almost impugned not just uh, Arvin, but the radical positions he was taking. It, it, didn't, it didn't just say this is bad messaging. Uh, it, it, it went beyond that. It accused, for the LP. It accused him of, of violating the non-aggression principle in cases where I didn't think that he actually had. The only thing that I think crossed that line was the school board shooting thing, which he disavowed, and he did say that was a joke, and he's very anti-violence in terms of that kind of thing. So the second reason that I, I really couldn't support censoring uh, Arvin over, over this stuff was that uh, just having the double standard bothered me, that, that we didn't censure Bill Weld, for example, who was the party's uh, 2016 vice presidential candidate. And he said a number of things that were quite unlibertarian, uh, advocating for hiring a thousand more FBI agents. He said things in support of gun control. He said things in support of Hillary Clinton, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, so if we're not going to censure the guy for being not libertarian enough, I don't want to censure the guy who's almost like being too libertarian, like too anti-government. I just think that's getting our priorities wrong. I mean, 
as bad as you might think it is to shoot up a school board, and I, I do think it's bad. I mean, there's libertarians sitting on school boards who are actually trying to help fix the problem. But as bad as that is, it pales in comparison to all the horrible things that government does. The world's highest incarceration rate in the United States, bombing people overseas, you know, uh, robbing people of their life savings, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so when you look at the big picture, you know, we, we don't need to be censuring the people that are, that are really uh, just getting carried away with their passion and their righteous anger against these kind of government abuses. We need to first clean our, our house and make sure that we're not uh, having people speak for us who are, are okay with uh, the things that government is doing that hurt people. So that's, those are basically the two reasons I couldn't get behind uh, censuring or removing Arvind Bora. I, I did encourage him to change his messaging, and if, if he hadn't disavowed the school board comment, I, I would have supported censuring him for that or maybe even removing him. All right. Well, then, any last words, Star Child? Uh, any last questions? <laughs> no, that was beautiful. I really, I really appreciate your time. And, and everything that we were able to sidebar into today okay. and just, uh, are, yeah, well, you so are you, you're, are you going to be a last thing then? Are, are you running for re-election at the 2018 National Convention? I haven't said officially, um, and I never say never, but I'm, I'm, I'm leaning against it. I think, I, I strongly believe in term limits. In fact, not just LNC members, but uh, senior staff as well, I think should have term limits because it's all about keeping that insider power from getting uh, built up. I want a bottom-up party and I think you know one term at a time is, is really enough and also I just um, you know I mean it's a significant expense for one thing I don't have a huge amount of money it costs thousands of dollars a year to fly around to the LNC meetings and then the, the third factor is just I, I'm not I'm not super feeling the, the passion right now I need to put some serious thought into really how to be effective as a, a, an LNC member uh, I, I, I can't say that I feel like I've been terribly effective on the LNC. I mean, I, I think I've done some good being there just as, as a vote and, and putting some stuff forward with the transparency issue primarily and some other issues, but um, the structure really has a lot of issues. We really need some bylaws changes. We really need some culture changes. And, and the way to do these things isn't isn't super obvious to me. And there may be other people that are waiting in the wings maybe maybe you're so maybe you're a real LNC. i don't know there's probably people out there who are radicals both ideologically and methodologically who could get in there and be a, a you know more effective than i've been so i, I don't want to you know sit on the seat if i'm not feeling the the passion let's let somebody else get in there and try to do a good job maybe i'll be back in a couple of years but i never say never because the, the, the problem is i go to the convention and i see <laughs> that i see that people are running i see people all oh, start you got to run you gotta stay in there and help you know we need you and the, I was like, okay, you know, <laughs> that's sort of what happened. I didn't intend to run again in 2016 either, but I got, you know, kind of persuaded into it. So I, I don't, I don't say, you know, I don't rule it out, but I'm not, I'm not keen on doing another turn right. right now. I'm going to be making sure he's running again in 2018. Comment in the, in the, wherever below, wherever you're watching this video, make sure that Starchild knows that you want him to run again and keep repping the LP. So make sure some other people who are, who are radical, if you're out there and you're, you're thinking, you know, you want to see more of a bottom up party, you want to see a more transparent party where the members have more power and it's less of an insider's game where we have like the 24 hour activist community center instead of a national office that feels like it's just there for the benefit of the staff doing their sort of nine to five thing. If you want to see that kind of a radical party, Please run for LNC. I will support you. Thank you, brother. Thank you, Adam. Always a pleasure. All right. Thank you to YouTube for hosting this video and for being an essential part of human progress by making video hosting available worldwide to everyone on the internet. However, the next phase in human progress is here with Steemit.com and their video hosting alternative blockchain-based solutions, including DTube. And you can find that through Steemit.com, as well as my own page there, at Adam Kokesh. This is a decentralized blockchain-based social media network that pays you fairly for your content. Already, I'm regularly making more there with a single post than I do from an entire month on YouTube. So please join us on the next frontier of the information revolution at steamit.com. And if you want help getting a leg up there, I'm happy to re-steam your posts and make sure that no one is starting from scratch. Just email me one of your favorite posts at adam at thefreedomline.com and we'll share it on my feed.